Signal and the future of encrypted messaging, ladies and gentlemen. The first session of the day. This is going to be fantastic because we're going to hear from Meredith Whitaker, Signal president and esteemed AI expert, to talk about the work that goes into sustaining this security startup, the dangers of data collection, Signal's efforts to resist governments and, to, uh, and uh, who are working to weaken encryption, plus an AI reality check ladies and gentlemen, and you must listen out for that. But this is going to be moderated by Zach Whitaker, no relation. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. It's not every day you get two unrelated Whitakers on stage, let alone both advocates of the same thing, and that's end-to-end -end encryption. For those who are in the audience, just to start, how many people have Signal app on their phone? Myself included. Fantastic. So Meredith, welcome. You have been the Signal president now for a year. Uh, how much of that year was spent defending end-to-end -end encryption to ensure that Signal can exist? Well, I think Signal existing is a way of defending into en encryption, making sure it's you know, out there and accessible to millions and millions of people every day. But I don't think it's a secret to anyone who got up in the morning, registered for this conference, and then came to this stage that end-to-end -end encryption and digital privacy you know, writ large, because of course end-to-end -end encryption is the technology we have that can ensure meaningful privacy in the digital world, as they used to call it. Um, and there is a concerted global attack on end-to-end -end encryption and the right to any privacy when we you know, use or are used by, assessed by you know, networked computation, generally. So we have, been, you know, we have been pushing back. This is existential for us. And we, you know, personally, I don't think we have a great chance of a livable future without guaranteeing the right to communicate privately um, online. And you know, that right means communicate privately, period, because you know, most of our lives are interpolated by network computation. So we can't not stop, uh, not start in the, the UK, where the UK was threatening to put an end-to-end -end encryption with the online safety bill. Uh, the UK uh, bill passed, but the government largely backed down, delaying the so-called spy clause until it was technically feasible to access encrypted content. You called this a victory at the time. Is this a victory or just kicking the issue down the road? Well, let me, I'm going to just zoom out a little bit and reframe some of this. Because one, I don't think you know, the will of those in power to cement their power via information asymmetry is not going away. You know, this is why they started freaking out about Diffie-Hellman in 1976 when it was released. This is before network computation was commercialized or even sort of a, a going concern among you know, consumer products. You then had the you know, personal computer. You had the, you know, the process that moved to commercialize network computation, the NSFnet, the ARPANET, et cetera, throughout the 90s, proceeding alongside the crypto wars. And why were these two things basically combined? because they were deeply concerned about the prospect that public key cryptography, what you know, allows end-to-end -end encryption, would enable networked computation and the growing commercial internet, which was projected to sort of you know, thread through our entire lives and economies, that this would cut off law enforcement access that they were counting on. So this was a real you know, hi highly fought battle. And you know, what I actually see when I go back through the primary sources, because I, you know, I need to always anchor my analysis in history. That's like who I am. Um, but what you see is that, you know, the crypto wars, we have, a, we have a narrative of success, right? We won the crypto wars, reason prevailed. We secured permissionless strong encryption that can be applied everywhere, right? And that's great. We need that. I'm not arguing against that. But what we did was we took our eye off the ball. We took our eye off markets. And so in effect, we traded encryption for privacy. Because right alongside that, in 1997, when Bill Clinton signed the sort of framework that set out the regulatory, you know, the regulatory framework for commercial, com the commercial internet, 
it was very clear that it was endorsing a surveillance business model, that the you know, advertising surveillance business model would be effectively the engine, the incentivizing engine of the commercial internet. So we enabled these surveillance giants in the hands of private companies, sort of taking our eye off the market, while allowing people to use strong encryption. Um, and I think that's coming back to bite us pretty hard right now because, of course, those surveillance giants didn't stay, you know, the, the surveillance data, the insights didn't stay just in the hands of these corporations. There was, you know, we see from the Snowden archives and, and other places that there was powerful, you know, almost like not even osmotic layers, but just, you know, the state and these corporations collaborating. And now there is a desire to foreclose on even the last bastions of privacy that we were able to you know, scrape out through the permission to use strong encryption. So in the UK right now, we have this very heightened sense of political rhetoric stoking the fire about encryption even yesterday when it regards to, to Meta. It seems like the debate in the UK with politicians at least where this where end-to-end -end encryption is kind of under fire uh, is still going on, even though much of the debate seems to have kind of closed for now with the bill. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been very confusing, particularly as an American who's not familiar with the Baroque ceremonies of the UK's political process. Um, <laughs> um, I'm learning, y'all. <laughs> um, so the bill passed, and what the bill the bill is, you know, one of these sort of omnibus Christmas tree bills. It started, you know, 2019, and it looked very, very different than what passed recently. And it still needs like a royal decree to actually go into law, but effectively, like the ceremony is over, and now we just, you know, dot the T's and cross the I's. Um, and the bill, you know, ended up kind of accumulating like, you know, a number of clauses that are kind of a Christmas tree for, you know, different, reg you know, agencies, different parts of government. One of them that was snuck in in September was Clause 122. And this clause is a, it's a very short, it's very vague in some ways, but it gives Ofcom, who is the UK's FTC slash FCC, so it's both the competition and telecoms regulator, the right to mandate that messaging services like Signal and others install accredited technology that would enable them to detect child sexual abuse material on their systems. Now, when you're talking about end-to-end -end encryption, of course, what you're talking about is a backdoor. You can put it in the front, you can put it on the side, but you know, what you're talking about is accredited technology is sort of a code word for a backdoor that would enable some type of scanning of messaging contents um, you know, that would ostensibly for the purpose of detecting child sexual abuse material, which again is you know, it's, a, it's horrifying. It is something that immediately like, brings to mind you know, some of the worst things we can think of and has been the narrative force that has been driving this renewed desire for um, effectively undermining end-to-end -end encryption. And then I think it's really important to recognize that what's also going on is an attempt to stop new deployments of end-to-end -end encryption. So this is you know, very much targeted at Meta who are rolling out the signal protocol for their messenger and Instagram DMs. You know, I think this is one of the few unequivocally good things <laughs> Meta is doing. So uh, awkwardly, I stand with them on that. Um, you know, particularly, like, let's be real, in the context of a US where you know, rights to expression, whether it be trans rights or the rights to access healthcare, are you know, deeply contested in some states. And we have already seen Meta DMs turned over or the messenger DMs turned over to law enforcement, used as the primary evidence to convict a mother and her daughter of accessing criminalized reproductive care in Nebraska post Dobbs. So this is not a game for me. This is not a game for anyone who comes from a place where this is actually being operationalized. However, there is an attempt in the UK to both undermine existing deployments of end-to-end -end encryption via this sort of, you know, they're calling it client-side scanning technology for end-to-end, -end, but what we're talking about is, you know, a fancy backdoor, um, or through sort of saber rattling with fines and other things that would effectively, they hope, prevent anyone else from deploying new encryption. And that, you know, we can look back to export controls regimes that were ended in the 90s, and you see, again, this is old wine in new bottles, right? Trying to figure out how to get back to a place where the government controls who can have privacy, if anyone, and, um, and encryption is not something that is actually 
available to use in a permissionless way um, directed by the people developing the services. I, th I think you bring some of this up, but what is the real reason, is this the real reason, driving these Western democratic governments to weaken encryption? Well, they haven't stopped, right? Like the drive to weaken encryption, you have a 1993 op-ed from Stuart Baker, right? This is around the clipper chip. In 1993, you know, the internet didn't exist. The web certainly didn't exist in any meaningful form. You're not talking about, you know, compute consumer PCs. You know, we're not talking about an environment that looks anything like we're looking at. But this 1993 op-ed that was effectively sort of championing backdoors and saying you, you need to get comfortable with backdoor encryption because it's the only way to go, it's the only way to keep you know, the country safe, et cetera. You has an entire paragraph arguing that PGP, which is public key encryption for email, doesn't really work, but you know, it, it is secure if you can get it working. Um, PGP is a tool for pedophiles, right? This is 1993. This is not like, again, it's an unevidenced claim. But this you know, continues to punctuate, these pretexts continue to punctuate as you know, the encryption debate as the justification that is being offered for breaking encryption, for eliminating digital privacy. Um, and you know, I actually have a timeline I've created of these. And you see you know, post-Snowden, you have 2013 Snowden revelations, right? 2014, Apple and Google encrypt iOS and, and Android, kind of you know, a desperate attempt to regain trust and some of the best stuff they've ever done. Um, and you know, thanks to Windows Snyder and others who made that happen at Apple um, and the folks at Google. But anyway, you know, immediately you have David Cameron calling for you know, the undermining of iOS encryption. You have Theresa May call it, you know, in 2017 calling for you know, eliminating encryption. You have a reaction to these iOS and Android moves that is invoking terrorism, invoking pedophiles, invoking you know, all of the, the specters of the you know, going dark debate, um, none of which are ever clearly evident. So I don't, you know, what we're not seeing is a new desire, but what we are seeing, I think, is a, this is a very serious like denouement in this ongoing fight. And I say that because I think you know, part of what happened is in 2016, WhatsApp completed their rollout of the Signal protocol to protect the contents of WhatsApp messages. And since then, you have seen a focus by many in the security services, so FBI, GCHQ, on trying to roll that back. Because that's arguably the first instance of ubiquitous, easy to use encryption that was meaningfully protecting privacy of billions of messages a day. So encryption was moving from the realm of you, know, the, you and your one friend who was willing to install PGP to something that was sort of ubiquitous, you know, odorless, just in the air, and you may not even know it's working for you, but it is. And, and there has been a push to figure out how to stop the rollout of more private messaging as you know, the Signal Protocol and others made it meaningfully possible to actually you know, have encryption in daily life that wasn't cumbersome and didn't sort of um, hinder the network effect that communication systems rely on. During the, uh, the online safety bill, when it was going through Parliament, um, Signal a staunch defender of, of privacy and end-to-end -end encryption, um, said it would leave the UK if the bill became law in its, in its current form at the time. No, well, uh, oh. So I got to be it's, so careful with course, this because yes. like, there are reply guys who are obsessed with <laughs> twisting this point, and I am a pedant. We said we would leave the UK or any jurisdiction mm. if it came down the ch to the choice between backdooring our encryption and betraying the people who count on us for privacy or leaving. And that's never not true. However, like, you know, there are a million shitty laws on the books and a million, you know, many, many different jurisdictions that are not being enforced, that are not coming down to the brass tacks of, you know, we're going to force you to install a backdoor or you need to be, you know, off the app stores and find or whatever. So, no, we're not leaving when the law is, you know, I think there were some headlines that got this wrong and then, you know, I think reply guys don't read the article, so. Was know. there a time where you thought that you <laughs> might end up leaving the UK and how that would, what would that even look like? We, I don't, you know, there was never a time when I wouldn't be willing to if those conditions, if it came down to that, right? But we're not, you know, we're not playing games. We're not doing stunts for like points. Like this is, you know, Signal is core infrastructure for meaningful private communication. It's the only nonprofit app that exists at scale that actually, you know, 
is highly available to millions of people every day around the globe. It is not owned by Meta. We don't collect metadata. We're not able to join this with data we buy for, from data brokers because we literally don't have that data. So Signal existing and serving as many people as possible around the globe is what we're about. We're not about political stunts. So we're not going to just pick up our toys and go home to like show the bad UK they're being mean. We're really worried about people in the UK who would live under a surveillance regime like the one that seems to be sort of teased by the Home Office and others in the UK. So, you know, we'll put we'll set up proxies. We'll do what we did in Iran. We'll do whatever we can to get people in the UK access to Signal. But we're not going to add a backdoor. So what does the future of end-to-end -end encrypted messaging look like to you? I mean, the future is a, you know, like, there's an invitation to participate, not a prediction that, like, you can sit back and let come true, right? Like, the future is, we're going to write the future, right? And let's say the future I want is one in which, you know, end-to-end -end encrypted messaging is just called messaging because we recognize that, you know, communications in digital space should respect the norm of human communications for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, which was if I'm talking to you, you know, my boss, my government, you know, my, you know, potential employer, you know, whoever is not surveilling that conversation. They're not keeping a copy of it that could be subpoenaed later. They're not putting that in a dossier that is, you know, being fed through some, you know, predictive AI system to determine that, like, my character isn't good, right? Like, none of that is happening. And I think that's, you know, that's what we need, honestly, for a livable future, because we can't organize, we can't contest power, we can't, you know, change the systems that need changing if we can't talk about what's wrong. You mentioned this a, a few moments ago about the, the data that Signal collects, or rather the data that we don't, Signal we don't. doesn't <laughs> collect data. Over the years, Signal has received a few search warrants. Uh, what did Signal have to give over in those instances? Um, so you can go to signal.org slash big brother, and you can see this. Um, we collect as little data as possible, and we go to great lengths to develop novel cryptographic techniques and you know, other ways that we are actually you know, avoiding collecting data. So in those subpoenas, what you'll see is we are able to affirm that a given phone number has registered for a Signal account. We can affirm when that phone number registered for a Signal account, and we can affirm the last time they accessed or that phone number accessed their Signal account. We have no other data. We don't know your profile photo. We don't know your profile name. We don't know who's in your groups. We don't know who's in your contact list. We don't know. We know if you were a donor, so we can give you the cute little badge you also donate. Um, but we don't know how much you gave, when you gave, or any other information. And we actually went to great lengths to separate those things. So um, we have very, very little data. And that's the only way to actually guarantee privacy. If you collect it, it can be breached. It can be subpoenaed. It can't, you can be forced to turn it over. And so we you know, proceed on a very strict ethos that we want as little as possible. And we'll go out of our way not to collect it. It's also worth noting that, as we saw with, with uh the overturning of Roe v. Wade uh, last year in the United States, um, you know, laws change over time and yeah. regimes change over time. And the data that's collected one day may be safe one day and then not the other. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is, you know, regimes change. What laws can... change. Data, you know, if you maintain your databases, data remains. So then what can startups in this audience uh, learn from Signal's minimal data collection practices? Well, that's a complicated question because the engine, the sort of economic engine of the tech industry is still monetizing surveillance. So you all can learn a lot, but if you are able to implement it with VC pressure, with a pressure for an IPO, with a pressure to add AI that requires huge amounts of data, that's the question. And that's where we have to actually face the economic model of the tech industry that we sort of allowed to run wild in the late 90s with very little checks and a lot of libertarian market enthusiasm. We have to recognize that that is, you know, that is an economic model shaped for and by surveillance. And that's part of why it takes Signal so much extra effort to actually maintain rigorous privacy standards. Because you know, deploying you know, the, the norms and the expectations of how an app works have been written implicitly by these large surveillance players. And it's difficult to, you know, encryption takes a lot more computational power. It's, you know, 
it's slower, it's a bit more cumbersome, there are things that it's difficult to encrypt, um, and all of that, you know, all of that also means Signal can't pivot quickly to become an AI company now that, you know, folks want to fund AI companies. We can't pivot quickly to sell ads because we're not, you know, I guess we could sell ads, but one, no one would put up with it. I would leave, I would never. Um, and, and, you know, we don't, again, we don't collect the kind of data that is the bedrock of the economic model for tech. And again, it's really expensive to build these services. So I think it's, it's also, you know, Signal costs millions and millions of dollars a year to run. That's why there's one signal and like a billion hypotheses for tech for good. Because, you know, you can, you can draft a, a business plan, but if it actually isn't sort of participating in the economic incentives that make tech profitable, which is monetizing surveillance, whether by AI or ads or whatever, then you're not going to be pulling in the revenue needed to pay for your servers, for your registration, for the highly trained talent required to maintain these servers forever, for the guys who are going to you know, drain some server because the buffer overflowed at night and you know, your uptime just went down in you know, some region that, you know, for the, all of it, right? It's very expensive. It's continual labor forever. And so the question is really a question of economic incentives, and I think we have to face that head on. Like, the tech industry is built on surveillance. How do we change that? Not simply how do we push back on the government, sort of trying to get theirs. With a few minutes left on the clock, I'd like to switch gears. Uh, you're also a world-leading expert in AI, <laughs> and we can't not bring yeah. that up. Uh, <laughs> you will be speaking with my col uh, colleague, uh, Devin Coldaway, on the main stage uh, later this afternoon. Um, so if you would like to see that, you should. Um, we can't go a day without an end of the world headline. Uh, can we get an AI reality check? What should we really be worried about in AI? Um, well, AI is a marketing term. It is currently being used to describe um, compute and data-centric machine learning techniques that require resources pooled in the hands of a handful of large tech companies who have more or less a natural monopoly over these resources. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, at this point, there's, you know, there's no such, I, I talk about this in a paper, if you all want to read a 30-page academic paper, there's one on open source AI that sort of breaks down the fact that what we're doing is projecting values and ideologies from the 1990s onto something we're calling AI, but there's no commensurate, you know, software in the 1990s looks nothing like the large-scale AI systems and their many different component parts and the huge amounts of resources required to both build and deploy them, et cetera. So you know, what we're talking about is a rebranding of monopoly power as intelligence, and we're talking about allowing that extremely powerful narrative of intelligence to propel these corporate monopolies into the hearts of our lives and institutions even further, making decisions and predictions that are shaping our access to resources, shaping whether we will have a job or we'll be you know, low bidding the other journalists on our like, gig economy journalism app and then going in and editing some chat GPT you know, content paste before we go live in our pod hotel or whatever, right? Like there's a real, <laughs> Um, there's a real fight happening, and I think the front line of that fight is the WGA and SAG strike right now, where we're not waiting for politicians who want a photo with Sam Altman to make a decision about a new regulatory agency or whatever. We're actually seeing people take this into their own hands and say, like, absolutely not. You're not, like, you know, sucking up all of human culture and then, like, putting the people who created that out of a job so that we can have, like, low-grade content on our weird streaming platforms. Um, and I think... Honestly, like the folks in this room, technologists need to step up and be part of that fight unless you want to be on the other side. I think a lot of, I think a lot of folks think about the data that comes out of AI tools and not about the data that goes into them as much. Uh, there will be folks in this audience who are using AI and generative AI. What advice would you give them? What should they be thinking about? Well, I mean, what do you mean using it, right? Like, I don't know, right? Like, I guess you're using it, like, you get a little prompt for your essay or something. But, like, this is not our tool, guys. Like, this is the tool of the studios, not the writers, right? Like, we may, you know, ChatGPT itself is an ad for the GPT API that is being licensed via Azure, right? 
And that's an ad that they're going to keep up for a while, but it's incredibly expensive to run these inferences against these huge models. So GPT is costing Microsoft millions and millions of dollars a year. There's an estimate that says you know, one week of running GPT as a consumer-facing interface costs as much as one training run to build a GPT model. So these are not tools that are just going to stick around for our little hobbyist interest to you know, spit out homework answers to us, right? Like these are tools that where you know, the economics of how much it costs to build them, the handful of companies that can actually build them, and the people who will be in a position to be incentivized to license and use them are not the people who are doing the writing, are not the people who are you know, doing the code, coding if we're talking about Copilot, right? They're going to be used to justify degrading that labor. And this is a story that goes back to the Industrial Revolution and further, right? It doesn't mean your labor is less valuable. It means we've found a really powerful pretext to say you're suddenly unskilled and thus deserve less pay. I know you'll be speaking more about AI on the disrupt stage with my colleague Devin yeah. Calderway later. Everyone wants to talk about AI. It's the trendiest thing right of now. Of course. Well, for now, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, Meredith Thank Whitaker. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.